Hello, and welcome to this session of AJC's Virtual Global Forum, where we're going to be discussing racism in America. I'm Julie Raymond, AJC's Deputy Director of Policy and Diplomatic Affairs. Before we dive into our conversation with Senator Booker, I want to give a little bit of background about AJC's involvement in the civil rights movement. Exactly one year ago, AJC helped launch the Congressional Caucus on Black-Jewish Relations from our 2019 Global Forum stage. Last week, that caucus held a timely roundtable discussion with 20 members of Congress and a group of Black and Jewish organizations, AJC among them, to present policy recommendations. AJC recommended the following. First and foremost, national and community-based task forces on racism. Second, stronger hate crimes laws. Third, important reform of our law enforcement community. Fourth, funding to help end systemic inequality and to educate America about our legacy of racism. Fifth, enfranchisement for all. And sixth and finally, government and police action to address white supremacy. AJC's history in the civil rights struggle dates back more than a century. As the late Martin Luther King Jr. noted when he received our highest honor in 1965. One of the highlights of our efforts was the amicus brief that we filed in the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education. When the Supreme Court unanimously voted to end segregation in public schools, they cited a study conducted by Professor Kenneth Clark, commissioned by AJC. We recently reaffirmed this commitment, and I quote from our statement, AJC, with more than a century's experience on the front lines in strengthening the fiber and fabric of American pluralism, stands in solidarity with the multitudes who have demonstrated peacefully against racism in the wake of the death of George Floyd. We pledge to continue relentlessly our pursuit of the realization of America's promise that all men are created equal. Not some men and women, but all. We were there at the start and we will be there until the end. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce a leader in the fight for American civil rights and racial justice, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Senator, thank you so much for being with us today. Let's it's dive so, right in. So good to be with you, thank you, of course. You've been on the ground floor of many recent bills to address racism, from finally making lynching a federal crime, to the Justice and Policing Act, to a bill to remove Confederate statues from the Capitol. Recognizing that it has taken us 400 years to get to this point and that much progress needs to be made, can you help us understand as we prioritize our advocacy, what's the hierarchy of need in your view? Well, first of all, I just wanna say thank you. AJC has um, been an extraordinary champion for justice. Uh, you live so many of the highest ideals of Judaism, um, this idea that if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, uh, what am I, if not now, when? And I think the thread that ties together all of the issues that, that I know you all hold to your core, uh, justice, equality, an end to racism, anti-Semitism, bigotry of any kind, I think a lot of this work on, uh, on the bills that you mentioned uh, have to deal with getting people's consciousness raised. We've become too comfortable with injustice in this country. We have a criminal justice system uh, that is way out of whack with the rest of humanity. We are the mass incarceration nation, incarcerating often the most vulnerable people uh, into our prisons and jails, people that need health care, that need addiction treatment, uh, folks that are often uh, in criminalized just for being poor. And the challenge is, is most of us just don't aren't aware of a lot of the injustices. What we see now across this country with people protesting uh, in the streets, all 50 states, thousands of cities, is that it's a wonderful thing that you see such diverse groups of folks who are confronting the injustices of our times. And so if there's an area for AJC to, in terms of prioritizing, it's just that awareness where people have need to be maladjusted to injustice again, and need to recognize that they are invested in the outcomes and to do nothing is complicity. That makes legislation passing a lot easier and a lot quicker when there are more Americans whose voices are demanding uh, that we create real change. You make it sound sort of common sense, but sometimes the most common sense efforts end up being really difficult. For example, yeah, I, I feel that way. I, today's a, a very frustrating day. 
as we're trying to get um, uh, hearings going around the justice and policing issue. And I have to remind myself uh, when I feel on days like this frustrated or feel like I'm banging my head against implacable walls of resistance, I have to remind myself that how long it took to pass civil rights legislation, voting rights legislation. In fact, the longest filibuster in this body was a racist rant uh, by Strom Thurmond blocking civil rights legislation. But people didn't give up. You know, you had uh, people facing terrible wretchedness, murders, uh, uh, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarner dying together, registering people to vote. Uh, you saw Medgar Evers. I can go through the names that we know, girls in a bombing in Birmingham. And as we say the names of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, let's not just say their name, but remember the conviction of people who face the same uh, wretchedness or worse. Uh, Emmett Till I, I, yet still found a way, uh, like Mamie Till did when she left the ca casket open for her murdered son with this brutalized body lying there as a call to conscience of others. Change doesn't come from Washington. It comes to Washington by people who are willing to take the darkness of our times and be light workers. That arc of the moral universe that King talked about that bends towards justice, there are people out there that have to take responsibility for being the arc benders and realize that from workers' rights that we take for granted, from suffrage uh, to, um, uh, to uh, civil rights legislation, it really took the demands of millions of people in diverse coalitions that ultimately created the atmosphere that we can make change. And that's what actually gives me hope right now in this moment. Looking at hope, there have been more than 200 bills to make lynching a federal hate crime. Right? And I think every person who, who put their name on those bills had that hope, but none of those bills have been passed by both chambers and signed into law. There's been a lot of emotion and turmoil publicly around the bill that you introduced with Senator Scott and Harris to finally remedy this injustice. Can you let us in a little bit to the, to the inner dynamics at play? Yeah, I, look, this is the first time in American history that we've had three African-Americans serving in the Senate at the same time. And um, this so. was an idea that time has come, you know, um, uh, and we saw that we had this incredible base of bipartisan, three African-Americans. I'm only the fourth popularly elected African-American in the history of our country. And we, we knew that this was a time to, to get something big done. And, you know, we got a bill together that's passed through the House of Representatives with only four votes against it. Only four Republicans voted against this bill and that we have 99 United States senators who are willing to support it. And so we've been working this and had an unfortunate conflict with, with Rand Paul, who seems to want to stop something that is so long overdue. Uh, between uh, 1877 and all, up into the 1950s, over 4,400 Americans, we have documented cases of lynching. Uh, this doesn't fully encapsulate people that just went, just disappeared. Um, this was a bill that was proposed over 200 times in Congress for more than a century. It's time is come. And so again, there will always be obstacles uh, in the way of, of, of freedom, of justice, of righteousness, um, but you just cannot give up. And um, I'm hurt and, and I think emotional in many ways to, to see us get this close to like the one yard line and, and yet, uh, I will not. I, I will not yield. Um, and I know that as more awareness has grown, because most people didn't know the facts I just shared with you. Um, uh, uh, most people are not aware that uh, lynching is not a federal crime. And so, the more people that become aware, I think the more pressure that we'll get this done. And I'm confident we will. But nothing, as as Frederick Douglass said, if no, if there's no struggle, there is no progress. The anti-lynching bill that you introduced with Senators Scott and Harris was a bipartisan bill, but a lot of these bills related to racial justice are totally partisan. And our country is already too divided on too many lines. What can be done to sort of bridge that divide? And why aren't your colleagues from the other side of the aisle supporting these efforts? You know, one of my colleagues uh, very frustratingly said, uh, the Republicans usually get it right. It just takes them about 30 years to catch up uh, to those people that are pushing bills. So we see this with LGBTQ rights, uh, tremendous resistance from people in both parties over our history. Uh, but fortunately, Democrats got there and then Republicans caught up. Um, we see this with a lot of issues that just seem 
uh, to not make sense. And um, I, I don't want to cast aspersions on an entire party because even in some of the bills I'm working on right now, the Cato Institute has come out in favor of aspects of our bill. Clarence Thomas has spoken uh, around qualified immunity. Um, I've had some Republican colleagues tell me that they're willing to work with me on so-called controversial elements of this. And so I'm not going to reduce this to just partisanship, but I do recognize that Mitch McConnell hasn't even refused, hasn't even allowed there to be a hearing or um, I should say uh, uh, debates on the floor around uh, pieces of legislation that in the House have bipartisan support. And so I, I just, I, I know that this is frustrating to a lot of people, um, but uh, that's why I think the election coming up is really important. Um, and that's why awareness is a really important. Um, there are really good folks in this country who call themselves Republicans and call themselves Democrats. Um, but the lack of engagement, remember King's letter, letters from the Birmingham jail uh, were not to, as he said, the, the KKK or uh, the White Citizens Council. It was to uh, white folks who were sitting on the sidelines knowing things were wrong but doing nothing about it. And so I get back to where I, the points I've made before. We have to have an awareness growth in our country. And, and, and Republicans or anybody who stands in the way of, of, of justice has to feel the consequences for that. And I know that just by seeing them doing a policing bill themselves, uh, it falls far short uh, from the kind of reforms that are needed in this moment. But the mere fact that the, you have the President of the United States releasing a, um, a uh, uh, executive order uh, tr trying to show, and again, to me, it is um, painfully inadequate, um, but this is being pressured to do something in this time. So this is the result of so many people out there protesting and working, and, and, and that's really what we need. Um, so I'm not giving up. I've gotten big bipartisan bills done, like the Criminal Justice Reform Act that has liberated thousands of people from prison already, disproportionately black and brown people. Progress is possible. We've seen it in every generation. But the question is, is how much are we willing to fight for it? It's heartening to hear you talk about the, the receptivity that you're getting from folks on both sides of the aisle. As an, as an organization that's committed to nonpartisanship and bipartisanship, um, that's something that's important to us, but I think it's also just important in the grand scheme of things for, for our country and for the ability of this important legislation to, to actually get passed. So thank you for that. I wanna switch gears a little bit. Uh, the first time that I met with you in your office, we spoke about the historically close relationship between Blacks and Jews, especially during the civil rights movement. And I think that we can be proud that at critical moments, our communities walked together and stood shoulder to shoulder. To shoulder. I think it's clear that we still need each other, right? Racism and anti-Semitism have not abated, but the relationship isn't what it used to be. What do we need to do to rebuild that foundation? Well, don't let uh, a few individuals ever steal away from the enduring truth of incredible alliances between blacks and Jews in this country. Um, uh, right here, this conversation is a testimony to that truth. Uh, I look at the people out protesting right now and I see uh, uh, people from all different religious backgrounds and yes, Jews leading uh, uh, many of the calls for justice. So I, I just, I often worry about um, uh, sort of a, a simplifying this down uh, um, and not realizing that I see it in uh, so many areas in which blacks and Jews are partnering uh, against injustice. But you're right, relationships always need work. They always need tending to. And I think it, it, they, they flourish the best uh, when you have individuals that say your suffering, your challenges, your injustices, I see them as my injustices. It's why Johann Prince um, uh, was one of the five people that spoke at the March on Washington right before Dr. King. Here's a man that escaped the Nazi regime in Germany uh, and was banished actually, um, uh, came to New Jersey, Newark, my city, and uh, began doing efforts uh, to stop the Nazis. But as he was going around this country, garnering support, he saw the savage injustices that African Americans were facing in many communities, particularly in the South. And that's when he knew he had to act and he had to engage. And again, that's the challenge we have. Um, how often have we visited prisons and seen that we are still a nation that shackles pregnant women, forces them uh, to make their own tampons because uh, they can't pay for that and then still afford calls to their children. 
that we still put children in prisons, in solitary confinement. Psychological professionals will agree that that is torturous and traumatizing, permanently damaging often to children's psyches. And you see the suicide levels of children going way up for those who have been in solitary confinement. Uh, that we live in a nation that access to health care, even when you control for income, uh, black women die at three, four times the rate of white women in childbirth uh, uh, in the postpartum era, uh, time period. Uh, that the number one indicator of whether we live around toxicity, uh, dirty water with lead or uh, um, um, uh, asthma causing particulates, cancer causing particulates, or even just toxic sites alone, the number one indicator is not income, it's race in this country. And I can go on and on and on. And if we're comfortable living in a society like that, Yoham Prince's speech on the March on Washington was all about silence in the face of injustice, in action in the face of injustice calling on Americans, all Americans, to understand that you are complicit in injustice if you're doing nothing about it. And have we grown so comfortable in our country uh, that you can't talk to a black man honestly and have an honest conversation with them where they can't tell you stories about having guns drawn on them, they can't tell you stories about being surveilled, followed in malls, can't tell you stories about run-ins with the police where they feared for their lives. I just came off the Senate floor where Van Hollen was talking about an African-American man who caught people dumping on his property. They were white men. And he, he told them that to leave, they got angry with him, that they wouldn't allow him them to dump a refrigerator on their property. They leave, they bring back three more men. They surround him, menacing him, jeering at him. He has a lawful gun on, and he pulls out his gun with one hand, his cell phone with the other, calls the police, they arrive. They arrest the, the black man, the pastor, on his own property and drag him to jail before the sheriff realized who he was and that they made a terrible, terrible mistake. Well, this happens every single day in this country. Are we comfortable with that? Are we satisfied with that? We may see an Ahmaud Arbery killed for jogging his neighborhood. We may hear about a Breonna Taylor killed sleeping in her own phone. We may witness the torture of a black man with a knee upon his neck. But can't we understand that those are the ones that are caught on videotape? What kind of country are we? Nothing will change unless we do. And if we wanna be about alliances, my voice has to speak up about a 50% increase in anti-Semitism over the last two years in our country. Vandalism to temples, uh, uh, threats and Nazi swastikas being painted. My silence in that face is complicity. We didn't have to, the horrors that happened in Pittsburgh. We, we, we didn't talk before uh, what happened at an incredible uh, uh, community uh, there. We, did, we didn't talk enough about the rise of anti-Semitism in our country. We were silent to it. We have to in our country, whether it's happening directly to our community or not, speak up because especially with blacks and Jews, I, uh, you know, I'm reminded of, of, of James Baldwin's letter uh, uh, to Angela Davis when she was in prison. And he just said, if they come for you in the morning, they will come for me at night. Hate is hate. And it's endemic, unfortunately. Systematic racism is endemic in too many of our institutions. All of us have an obligation to speak out about it, especially because we are bound together in destiny. Uh, and the black and Jewish communities who've known so much targeting and suffering and horrific murder and death, uh, we are bound together in many ways through experience uh, to have uh, a role as a conscience of this country. And I'm grateful for Jewish leaders like yourself and others who understand that role. Our country has, is replete with examples of Jews who understood their commandment of doing justice, as it says in Micah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I and I think in so many ways, these times are those times, but in some ways they're not, right? We're not in the same era of James Baldwin and, and Angela Davis. And there are protests and movements in this country that recently, and because of Israel, have routinely um, rejected or actively alienated Jews. And my question is this, is how can Jews actively be advocates of the Black community now if other allies would rather exclude us than have us be a part of their ranks? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I feel that question as much as I hear it, um, where I have been frustrated myself 
uh, with seeing uh, uh, forces trying to uh, delegitimize the state of Israel um, and see uh, individuals who don't even believe the Jewish homeland should exist. And um, it, it, it hurts me. I, I, and, and especially in this environment as a senator, I get frustrated when people try to make it a partisan issue uh, uh, in order to score political points one way or the other. Uh, I, I remember working hard with Ben Cardin on a bipartisan uh, uh, repudiation of the BDS movement and being how, uh, so frustrated that we got this incredible deal done that could have gotten 90 plus senators on it. And then Mitch McConnell at the last second decides to put a very partisan version of that bill on the floor to draw a political wedge between Democrats and Republicans in the Jewish community. And then amazingly, uh, I went to uh, uh, Jewish leaders, including in APAC, and said, here's a cure to that that could get numerous other Democratic senators on board. Uh, everybody from APAC to other Jewish leaders agreed on the amendment, but Mitch McConnell refused to even get a vote on it on the floor. And so there's cynical folks um, who want to try to uh, divide uh, alliances, uh, divide unity, um, to exploit uh, fear and bigotry to whatever their political aim is. And so, as I learned from one of the greatest books I've ever read, uh, uh, Man's Search for Meaning and Viktor Frankl, um, where he, he talked about you're, you're defined uh, uh, in that space between stimulus and response, how you choose to respond to this world. Uh, you're not defined by the hatred. You're not defined by the divisiveness. You're not defined by the bigotry. You're defined by how you choose to respond to it. And so in the face of those who try to divide, in the face of people who want to try to delegitimize, my hope always is that we will live up to our highest values anyway. Um, I, I can't tell you how this period of, of Donald Trump has actually been the most hopeful four years of my life. And because I define hope as an African-American woman in Newark taught me, uh, the, the tenant leader, my, one of my greatest influences, the tenant president of the projects I lived in, whose son was murdered in the lobby of the building I lived in, and yet she never left, never gave up. She taught me in a sense that hope is the active conviction that despair will never have the last word. And, and I'll never forget when the Muslim ban uh, came in, in January of 2017, and I raced out to Dulles Airport with a federal court order to make sure those detained families from other countries, Muslim families, would get access to lawyers. But when I got into the concourse and I saw a concourse full, hundreds and hundreds of Americans singing songs and chanting and patriotic slogans. And whenever uh, uh, Muslim families emerged from uh, uh, the, the, the con into the concourse, these were people just erupted these were not American citizens. These, these, were, these were Muslim families from other countries. People erupted in cheers, celebrating them, saying, I don't care what happens in this country. What the President of the United States is trying to do, I will have the last word, and the last word will be my cries of, of, for justice, my, my, my welcoming the stranger. And that was one of the most beautiful things I saw that evening, was a circle of Orthodox Jews with kippahs on and sitsas hanging out, celebrating in glee over Muslims coming into our country. I get chills now when I think about it, the, the beauty of these people who lived their values. I believe fundamentally that before you tell me about your religion, show it to me and how you treat other people. I still remember them linking arms and dancing like I was at a Jewish wedding. That's how much joy they found in strangers, in greeting strangers, because they were once strangers in a strange land. So there will always be darkness. There will always be bigotry. I don't think we can ever think that we've snuffed it out. We must remain always vigilant. But what will define the character of this country, what will define the Jewish people and the black people who are interwoven into the fabric of America, what will define us is how we respond to that darkness and those who will try to exploit and be opportunists. And I say, uh, as Viktor Frankl taught us, let's define ourselves by no matter how much the darkness we face by being light workers, how much how much hate uh, we see, let's let's define it by bringing radical love to those who try to hate us or do us wrong uh, or to who are are, are, are fragile or uh, despairing or hurting. 
Radical love. Senator, I know you have to go back to the Senate floor. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. A few weeks ago, we had the privilege of speaking, much like we are today, with the first Black Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch. We asked him this question. It equally applies to you, so I want to ask you also. Some might look at you and say, what inequality? Here is an incredibly accomplished and respected senator who worked hard and won election after election. To some, you are proof, right? Bonnie Bunch is proof, Barack Obama is proof that there are no longer boundaries or issues of access in America. Surely there are signs of progress everywhere we look. What do you say to that? Well, look, I don't know if folks want to point to me as somehow to relieve us of the burden to deal with the enduring racial uh, um, uh, challenges of our country. And my experiences alone show me that we can do so much better. When I got to the United States Senate, I was shocked. It was the least diverse place I had ever worked. And me and Brian Schatz, a great senator, Jewish senator, uh, and I went to Chuck Schumer, great senator, also happens to be Jewish. And the three of us said, we got to do something about this. And we decided to have every Democratic senator have to publish their diversity statistics. And you know what? You could, you could talk to Chuck Schumer, but he may have shared with me that there was some discomfort in having to allow sunshine in and to be held accountable for what percentage of your staff is women or black or Latino, and are they in positions of power and authority? Well, guess what's happened since? Is Since then, you've seen a lot more people of color hired. And, and which is important to me because this body is making laws in places like the Judiciary Committee that disproportionately seem to impact black and brown people. And so I, I think that anybody who wants to say that somehow we're in a post-racial society needs to look at the data and look at the evidence from the criminal justice system to environmental injustice to our economy to our healthcare system and see that when you control for other factors that race is still a very dominant influence in what kind of health care you'll get, what kind of education you'll get, what kind of job opportunities you'll get, what kind of uh, encounters you'll have with the criminal justice system. And so I've, I'm remarkably blessed, uh, I, I, but I grew up in a household that even the house I grew up in, in 1969, it was uh, uh, literally, my parents were turned away and told it was already sold. And a white couple posing as home buyers came right after my parents and found out it was still for sale. They walked into the real estate agent on the day of the closing. The white couple didn't show up to their closing. Instead, my dad did. And a lawyer happened to be a Jewish lawyer, Marty Friedman. And they walked into the real estate agent's office and confronted them. And the real estate agent didn't relent. He punched Marty Friedman in the face and yeah. sicked a dog on my dad. Well, eventually, after a lot of rigmarole, I moved into this town. As my dad used to say to me, boy, don't you walk around this house like you hit a triple. You were born on third base. You drink deeply from wells of freedom and opportunity that you didn't dig. They taught me that, yeah, I, I had horrible conversations with my parents about being realized that, you know, take, take care <laughs> of yourself because whether it's encounters with police, people are going to see a large black man as a suspect to be feared. But they also told me that that doesn't define me. What I do with the blessings I've received, I have an obligation to make the most out of every opportunity presented to me. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, my parents taught me that the greatest thing I could do is not personal accomplishment, but, but to service to others. And that I couldn't pay back the blessings I had, I had to pay them forward. And so I, I've had a remarkable life, but I cannot in any way uh, be comfortable with my accomplishments when there's so many Americans from LGBTQ Americans, trans black Americans who are being killed at alarming disproportionate rates. I, I can't be comfortable when I still live in a nation where hatred towards Jews is made manifest through violent action. I, I can't be a comfortable in, in a country uh, where people with disabilities are discriminated against still routinely in our country or people with a, a, a health care challenge called mental illness or end up in our jails and prisons. This is still a nation where we have much work to do. And the only way we could prove worthy of the sacrifices, suffering, bloodshed, trauma that our ancestors overcame to give us the privileges we enjoy 
uh, is not to grow comfortable, but to say, stay with an urgent, everyday urgency, asking yourself the question, what am I doing for others? How well am I serving? And, and I'll, I'll end with, with just this. I, 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 I get very emotional when, when I think about uh, my, the black men I've had conversations with, including Lonnie Bunch. I watched him in an interview say that when he saw George Floyd killed, one of his feelings was that it could have been me. I could have been jogging through a neighborhood like Ahmaud Avery and killed. I could have been sleeping in my house in a no-knock warrant. I could be mistaken identity. I could be perceived as a threat reaching for a cell phone and killed. Or I could have passed a $20 bill that I didn't know was counterfeit, have the police called on me, and next thing you know, a knee on my neck. And so maybe there's some wisdom in the Torah and this overlap between the words of the Torah and the words of a king, Martin Luther King. If the, at the place where he's dead, where he was killed, after giving this powerful speech that called to a mountain in Israel named Mount Nebo, called to the Old Testament, the, the, the Torah story of, of, of Moses going to the mountaintop and seeing the promised land. And in that final speech, King said, I've been to the promised land and I've seen over. I've been to the mountaintop, I'm sorry, and I've seen over, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will make it to the promised land. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And then just hours later, he's slain at the Lorraine Motel. After being prophetic in that speech about Mike not getting this to the promised land himself. Well, if you go to the Lorraine Motel right now, you will see a marker there where he died with words of the Torah on it. And there were the words of Joseph's brothers that they, they exclaimed these words before they grabbed Joseph and threw him into a well to die. But we know he didn't die there. He rose up and helped lead a nation through crisis, Egypt. And the words that Joseph's brothers exclaimed, written there where Martin Luther King was slain, are, are, are the words from the Torah are these, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. How many Americans have died for the dream of this country? How many people have died being shortchanged by those who would cheapen the dream and, and the question that has to be answered is not by the echoes of our ancestors, but by us. What will become of our dream? Will it become divided, demeaned, degraded? Will we perish in the pit of darkness? Or will we in this generation, like those before us in dark and challenging times, will we rise over hate, rise over discrimination, rise over the challenges of our time? If not now, when? This is the moment. This is the time. And I'm grateful to have allies and friends who share my conviction um, that the dream will not die and that we can still have impossible hope uh, that we can make the dream real in our generation. Indeed, thank you. We have the hope and the willingness to work. And we're proud to work with you and to, to have this partnership and this friendship. Thank you for your, for your vision, for your leadership, for your friendship, um, and frankly, for this inspiration that I think we all needed during this time. Thank you. Well, Yasha Koch to you and all, all the folks uh, within your phenomenal organization has been friends of mine long before I became a senator, so thank you. My name is Dove Wilker. I'm AJC's Director of Black Jewish Relations. I'm here today with my friends, Warren and Jason, outside the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. King preached a message of hope, unity, and love, of nonviolence, and the importance of speaking out. Today, when we think about Black Jewish Relations, it's important for us to speak out. It's important for us to think about how we can support our friends and family in the black community. 
Hi, my name is Lauren Linder. I'm a member of the Atlanta Black Jewish Coalition. Um, if you're wondering how we're feeling right now, probably a whole bunch of different things. Um, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, tired, angry, upset. Um, but most importantly, uh, we are thankful for our Jewish brothers and sisters reaching out to us um, and standing up. So if you're wondering what you can do, I don't have all the answers. One thing I'd recommend is that you learn how to be an anti-racist, not just not racist, but an anti-racist. There are lots of book lists, movie lists, articles that you can read, do some searching online, get yourself smart and get yourself to a position where you can really be an effective ally. Hi, my name is Jason Estevez and I'm a 2017 Project and a Change alum. And as Lauren mentioned, uh, this is a challenging time for the black community and we need our Jewish brothers and sisters to stand with us to dismantle a 400 year system uh, that is oppressing our, our community. And systemic racism is not easy to dismantle. We can't do that work alone and we need your help. It's important for us to remember that we need to speak out. That we need to say something. We need to reach out to our friends. For the Jewish community, it's our time to support those in need, as they've done so often for us. At this time of rancor and division, and in this place of healing and remembrance, AJC joins hands with fellow Americans, representing the varied fibers of the tapestry of this great land, summoning them to stand with us, draw strength and inspiration from each other, and together with us, convene the community of conscience. Join us in the spirit of the American motto, E Pluribus Unum, as we unite across difference, celebrate our diversity, contribute to a shared society, and resolve to advance the welfare of all. Join us in the spirit of patriotism as we strive proudly and boldly to uphold American ideals of equality, of dignity, of opportunity for all. Join us in the spirit of civility as we reject anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry, incendiary partisanship, whatever its sources, dehumanizing and demonizing rhetoric and threats of violence. Join us in the spirit of democracy as we reaffirm and reinforce our constitutional system, seek equal justice for all, and safeguard our fundamental freedoms. Join us in the spirit of American pluralism as we promote mutual respect, not mere tolerance, as the standard enlightenment its coexistence. Join us in the spirit of inclusiveness as we reach out to uplift the poorest among us, as we welcome the stranger in our midst, and as we fully enfranchise the differently abled. Join us in the spirit of love as we counter those who purvey H intolerance and incivility, especially those who legitimize their inappropriate practices based on holy writ. Join us in seeking to fulfill the biblical teaching that we are all Betelem Elohim, all created in the divine image, the very foundation of human equality. Join us in pursuing the prophet Isaiah's age-old vision that one day nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, that peace, love, and unity will reign. 
For those who believe, as we do, that our liberty and aspirations depend on the noble principles articulated by President Lincoln and defended by generations of brave Americans since the founding of this republic, our call could not be more urgent. We invite all who share our concern for the future of this great country, our appreciation of its fundamental strengths, our conviction that it must overcome its challenges, and our resolve to honor the American spirit to join us in the community of conscience. Hello, I'm Harriet Schleifer, president of AJC. Every June, we come together at AJC Global Forum. Being there, we're at the center of the most important conversations affecting the Jewish people in our world. This year, the pandemic changed everything. AJC responded by bringing the world to you. Thank you for inviting us into your homes. Your commitment to the issues discussed here today is critical please consider making a donation to AJC. Together, we can do even more to fight anti-Semitism and hate, stand up for Israel, and defend the values that unite us all. To donate, please visit ajc.org forward slash give. Thank you.